Welcome to News Now. I'm Anne Marie Mahoney, your host for today, and I am very excited to be interviewing Kwan Q Lai about her memoir, The Girl Who Taught Herself to Fly. Kwan Q is a Belmont resident. She's also my neighbor uh, and a doctor specializing in infectious diseases. I'd like to begin our conversation today by giving Kwan Q an opportunity to give us just a quick overview of her professional background and her recent humanitarian work. Kwan Q. All right, thank you, Anne-Marie. Uh, I will make this very brief. As you introduced me as an infectious disease doctor, I am now working part-time in Bethesville Leahy Healthcare and volunteer some of my time uh, in using my medical expertise in various humanitarian organizations and work. Unfortunately, because of the pandemic, um, COVID-19, I my last uh, overseas uh, mission, mission work was in Yemen, which is almost three plus years ago. And since the pandemic, uh, I have, have been concentrating my efforts uh, in the United States and uh, mainly doing COVID-19 uh, volunteer work uh, in New York City at the peak of the pandemic and at various times in the Navajo Nation. Uh, I contributed some of my time there and of course with the hurricane related responses uh, in the last few years. Okay, excellent, thank you. Um, your memoir of growing up in Malaysia as a female in a very large family is really a fascinating read and I, I recommend it to anybody. Can you talk a little bit about the value of females both in the family and in the Malaysian society while you were growing up? Well, during the time when I was growing up, um, perhaps even now, maybe in very poor income families, uh, women or girls, uh, will not value as much as boys because we, as women or girls, um, are not able to pass on our family name. So if you are married off, your, the, your family name is not going with you. So we, the, the girls were often taken out of school very early on, so they never finished school completely. And they, are, they were either put in the family to take care of household chores or they were farm out as domestic help uh, to earn money to help out with their family expenses. So women at that time were delegated to child bearing and child rearing. And of course, now it is much better. Uh, a lot of the women now in Malaysia uh, have the opportunities to go for higher education and uh, also in the workforce, working in the workforce. So things have changed for the better. All right, excellent, good to know. Um, building on that education theme, can you tell us a little bit about the value of education in your life, but also in the lives of your siblings growing up? I was born in a very, very poor family. So when you were at the bottom of the social rung, the only way you could pull yourself up uh, was to have a good education. That was something that I quickly un understood when I was at a young age. Um, the, most of the government jobs uh, that are farmed out to, to the public are dependent on your education level. So a, a good education is a, quite important. And the other thing in, in the social uh, world where I was, was uh, social connections. So the more wealthy and the more connected you were in, in a family, in your family, you're more likely to get good jobs. Uh, being that my family was both poor and not educated, we were not associated with any powerful family. So the only way for us, uh, for my siblings and for me, is to get out of the cycle of poverty and getting out of a social status was to get a good education. So we more or less knew that that was the way that we had to go. Okay, very good. And you, you talk about the various schools that you were able to access um, to get that education. It really is a very interesting journey. Um, what, as you went from school to school, what made you so focused and what comes across in the story is really so driven 
not only to get this education, but to be the best in your class. Well, if you, when you read the story, you really see that there's not much choice for me. Um, it was my education became my lifesaver uh, to get out where I was. And uh, growing up, I had so little, my, uh, that my time of my life was revolved around going to school and after school, coming back and helping my father to run his uh, food stall and uh, nothing else. Even if we have other interests, uh, my family could not support us financially uh, to pursue other interests. So my life was revolving around getting myself educated, helping my family to get financially um, independent and not much else. So to, to me, if I had, I became the best in my class, the more likely I could, would be offered a scholarship. So that was the reason why I thought I should be really working hard. There was not much else to do, but to go to school and to study. So there was a, not a lot of choices. I love the whole chapter where you talked about spending time in the library, just reading and accessing as much information as you possibly could. And I thought, you know, that was really remarkable given your circumstances. Um, fast forwarding, being admitted to Wellesley College was quite an accomplishment. Uh, what was your transition to college in the United States, but especially in the Boston area, whose climate is very different from Malaysia? Uh, what was all of that like for you as a, what, 17, 18 year old? A lot of excitement, you know, to, from, from a, a, a young girl who would never, I left the island maybe twice uh, to the mainland and then taking the ferry to the mainland. That was a big deal. I never flew, I never flew on a, an airplane. So that was the first time ever flying an airplane across the Pacific to the United States. And arriving at college, um, many challenges, I, I would face many challenges such as a new country, a uh, new climate, uh, culture, different kinds of food, uh, new friends. And even though I spoke English, it was the Queen's English, not American English. So there are some transitions, some adjustment that I have to make and different school system. So our school system was based on the English system. And here I was thrown into an American system. And uh, so there, there were many adjustments that I have to make. Looking back, I'm kind of amazed that I was able to overcome all those differences and uh, did well in school, uh, which is kind of amazing for a person from a different background. The, the sheer beauty of the campus really floored me. It's so beautiful and every single time I would go back, it would just be very tranquil and beautiful in the campus. The other thing that I noticed was when you, when you were a foreign student, you get invited to different houses and uh, the, the different homes that I visited at Wellesley, you know, when I would marvel at the beauty of the home decorations and the incomparable richness and wealth uh, make my uh, home, uh, the squalor and the uh, extreme impoverished conditions of my home, starker. And uh, so it, it was something that is uh, a, a big adjustment, uh, trying to uh, think about all the things that uh, America had, and we didn't grow up to, to enjoy any kind of things like that. So it, it was a, a big transition for me, but it was a good one. Sounds like a huge leap. What would you like readers to take away from reading your memoir? First of all, I like people to kind of reflect on what they have and to be grateful for what they have. And a lot of times living here for the last many years now, I would hear a lot of complaints about you know, what we have or what we don't have. But I think that people in the third world and the developing countries really have very little and they seem to adjust to that. So we need to be grateful for what we have. 
we need to remember that every child in the world can choose to be born where they like to be born or to have the parents that they like to have. So not everybody has that privilege. And uh, we always have to remember there are many, many, many children, even now who are stuck in refugee camps, who are not allowed to have school or to have continued education, and such as the Afghan in Afghanistan, the young girls are still not allowed to go to school. So we have to remember that there are things like that still happening in a modern world. So, and the other thing is uh, the sexist nature of poverty, uh, especially towards uneducated women and girls. So that's the, the thing that I like people to, to take home uh, to the lessons from reading my book that we have to be grateful for what we have. And we, have, we still do have to remember that there are young ladies and young girls in the world who do not have that kind of privilege to go to school every day. Thank you. Yes, excellent things for us to remember. Thank you. Thank you so much for this conversation. I'd like to remind our audience that um, you are doing an author talk and book signing at the Belmont Library on October 25th at 7 p.m. Um, I invite everybody to come and meet Kwan Q in person, have an opportunity to talk to her. She will be signing her books. Um, until then, thank you for tuning in to News Now. I'm Anne-Marie Mahoney, and I'm looking forward to the next time being with you. Thank you. Thank you, Anne-Marie.